During the Second World War, crime in England rose by 57%. It is without doubt true that war brings with it new waves of crime, more often than not committed by opportunistic predators who use warfare to distract authorities from their crimes. Welcome to Wartime Crime, a series wherein we evaluate cases of crimes committed during war and shine a light on just how brutal these opportunistic cases can be. From September of 1940 through to May of 1941, Germany launched a mass bombing campaign that would end up both terrifying and devastating the citizens of the United Kingdom. This series of continuous bombing came to be referred to as the Blitz. The estimated losses are reported as being 40,000 civilians killed, with many more than that injured, over 3,300 aircrew killed, 2,250 aircraft lost, and over 2 million homes lost, more than 60% of which were in London. Throughout the Second World War, the United Kingdom had put into place rules for civilians to follow during the night time, a procedure called a blackout. All sources of light would be cut off, thick, dark curtains would be drawn as to avoid reflecting or outputting any sources of light, and any forms of public lighting such as street lamps would also be cut off. It was said by officials at the time that this would assist in keeping the German planes blind in the sky, preventing them from seeing any well-lit targets. In reality, thousands of accidental deaths were caused by the poor lighting conditions, and experts have since claimed that these blackout procedures were put into place only to test the cooperation of civilians, and that the blackout does not provide any strategic benefit in combating the enemy line of sight. It was during this war and ongoing blackouts, yet after the devastating attacks by German air forces, that one individual decided to set about on a deadly spree. Born on the 18th of February, 1914, in York, England, Gordon Friedrich Cummins has a largely unknown history. With even his birth date being a point of controversy, the earliest confirmed information is his marriage in 1936. It seems that he certainly got married, but no solid evidence of to whom or where the ceremony took place has ever been uncovered. He volunteered to join the Royal Air Force, RAF, in 1935, and, by 1942, had established himself as a leading aircraftman. He received the nickname The Count due to his claims of noble heritage, though this is yet another point of controversy. Despite being a leading aircraftman, he was still on the ground crew, and so requested aircraft training. This request was accepted, and he was posted at the RAF ACRC, Royal Air Force Air Crew Reception Centre, in Regent's Park, London. The course he enrolled in was due to take place between the 2nd and 25th of February. While there, however, Cummins decided to take in his surroundings and make the most of his stay. On Sunday the 9th of February, the body of 41-year-old pharmacist Evelyn Hamilton was found in an air raid shelter in Montagu Square, London. She had been strangled and her handbag containing 80 pounds stolen. Apart from the strangulation marks, the body had not been mutilated and there was no evidence of any sexual activity. The very next day, the body of Evelyn Oatley, aged 35, was discovered in her flat at Warder Street. She had been stripped of clothing, strangled, had her throat cut out, and was sexually mutilated with a can opener. Fingerprints recovered from the scene indicated that the assailant was left-handed. At the time, these two murders, despite being committed back-to-back, -back, had not been linked to one killer due to their differing circumstances. This makes the fingerprints the first clue in both killings, though in the eyes of the authorities, these were two separate cases entirely. The following day, on the 11th, another crime had been committed, this time at Gosfield Street. Margaret Florence Lowe, aged 43, had been strangled with a silk stocking and her body mutilated with a range of tools. Confirmed is the usage of a razor blade, knife, candlestick, and a poker. Her body was not found until three days later, on the 14th. The pathologist, Bernard Spilsbury, stated after examining her body, that it was, quote, quite dreadful, end quote, and that the murderer was, quote, a savage sexual maniac, end quote. 
He additionally stated that the similarities between the killings and mutilations convinced him that they were all done by the same person. The 12th of February, two days before Margaret's body was found, strangled with a scarf, lying naked and brutally mutilated, was Doris Joannet, found in her and her husband's shared flat at Sussex Gardens. Later examination of the corpse led to findings in a similar fashion to the bodies of Oatley and Lowe days prior. It was at this point that the newspapers began to describe the killer as the Blackout Ripper, a clear reference to the case's similarities with Jack the Ripper, the London-based case of a serial killer who brutally mutilated his victims 54 years prior. The citizens of London were growing restless. They already had enough to worry about during the blackouts, and now, in addition to that, needed to be on the watch for a dangerous criminal who used the cover of night to his advantage. This collective unrest peaked just two days later, on the 14th of February, when Greta Haywood was attacked near Piccadilly Circus by a man in RAF uniform. She had rejected the man's sexual advances, and he had grown impatient. Before able to turn her into his next victim, however, he was startled by a delivery boy making his rounds, which led to the attacker fleeing the scene. As he fled in a panic, he left behind a vital piece of evidence an RAF-issued gas mask in its container with the number 525987 printed on the side. The police now had very solid evidence to go off of, left-handed, RAF uniform, and an abandoned RAF-issued gas mask. All masks have identifying digits printed into their sides, painting a very clear picture of who the attacker may have been. As the police were following this newfound trail, a new assault had been reported. A prostitute named Kathleen King had approached a man and offered her services. She charged him two pounds and requested a taxi ride to her home near Paddington Railway Station. They entered her flat and quickly began undressing each other when they were interrupted by the blackout being called. Taking advantage of this, the man tried to strangle her, but still wearing her shoes, she had kicked him in the stomach prompting the attacker to make a hasty exit. He had thrown her five pounds for her troubles, but during his escape had left behind yet another piece of vital evidence. The RAF-issued belt that had been left at the flat, as well as all other pieces of evidence, had led the authorities to an RAF serviceman, Gordon Cummins. Little did the angered public know that the police had been working diligently behind the scenes and collected fingerprints from two of the flats where the prior murders had taken place. Now formally placed under arrest and safe in police custody, Cummins' quarters were searched on the 16th of February. Almost instantly, investigators found multiple items belonging to his victims, and his fingerprints perfectly matched those of the attacker. His trial began on the 24th of April at the Old Bailey. However, due to the presentation of an incorrect exhibit, the trial was restarted with a new jury on the 27th. The evidence against Cummins was undeniable, and, after a one-day trial, the jury took just 35 minutes to find him guilty of murder, and he was thereby sentenced to death by hanging. An appeal was made in early June, but was swiftly dismissed. He was executed by Albert Pierrepoint on the 25th of June, 1942, at Wandsworth Prison, perhaps ironically during an air raid. Charges for the other murders remained on file, and Scotland Yard later claimed that Cummins had probably murdered two more women during air raids in London earlier than his convicted crimes in October of 1941. The foremost fingerprint expert of the day, Detective Chief Superintendent Friedrich Sherrill, was instrumental in proving the case against Cummins. <laughs>